So viewers, welcome to IMF TV. We are so glad you are here with us today. We appreciate you for coming and watching us every Saturday. We have a very wonderful subject today to discuss and I know you are eager to hear what we have today. We really appreciate you once again for coming to watch us. You know, IMF TV is here to bring hope to the hopeless and also to, bring, to make people understand Christ for who he really is. That is the whole idea. So every Saturday when we come your way, we want you to comment, share, and tell us, suggest what you think we should do better to make this whole thing grow. Because we have to grow in Christ, as Christ expects us to do. So that is the idea behind this whole thing. Today we have a discussion on the subject of the cross. The cross of the Christ. We see it everywhere. We have heard about it, but do you really understand the cross? Do you understand the significance of the cross? Do you understand the purpose of the cross? Today we have a very wonderful woman of God, Dr. Martha Mokesh from CTS, Columbia Theological Seminary here in Decatur, Georgia, to help us understand more about the cross and what it entails. So I'm going to let Dr. Mata introduce herself to us, and then we go into the discussion for today. Be there, don't go. We are here with you. So Dr. Mata, welcome today. Thank you so welcome. much. It's very, it's we a great, appreciate you coming. It's a great privilege to be here. Yeah, so um, as uh, Mavis said, my name is Martha Moore Kish. I, um, teach at Columbia Seminary, where I have taught theology for the past 15 years. I am uh, from the U.S. originally, grew up in Florida. Um, I'm an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church, USA, married with two children. My husband is also a pastor, um, and uh, I have a, a great interest in Reformed theology, also in issues around worship. Um, so, just glad to be with you today. Thank you for coming once again. So we are going to go into the discussion right away. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about the cross? The yeah. cross, the cross. We hear it a lot. Everywhere right. we go, we see the signboards everywhere. Right. The cross, the cross mm -hmm. of Christ. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So I think the first thing to say about the cross is that it's one of those parts of the story of Jesus that we have in all four Gospels. It's clearly central to the Jesus narrative, and it's one of the few things that we also know from outside historians. So the historian Josephus, who was a Jewish historian writing at the same time, also tells us that there was a man named Jesus who was crucified. So it's one of those facts, those historical facts, that we actually have attested from outside scripture sources as well. So the first thing to say is that there is no doubt that Jesus really was crucified. That's one thing to say. Another thing to say is um, it's important to think about what crucifixion meant mm -hmm. at the time. Yes. And what we know is that crucifixion was practiced a lot by the Roman Empire. Yes. Jesus was not the only, not just one of a few. There were hundreds of thousands of people who were crucified um, in that regime. And why were people crucified? A number of reasons. But we know that um, the fact that he was crucified suggests that he was seen as a threat by the political powers. Mm -hmm. So we know that he was um, understood to be a threat to Rome as well as to the religious authorities of the day. Yes. So that the, the cross tells us something uh, about who Jesus was seen to be mm -hmm. politically. Yeah. Um, so those are some of the things I'd want to say to okay. begin with. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. Like you said, Jesus really died. Yeah. We have established that fact. Yep. So now we know he died. Yep. But what lessons does that teach us? Good. Yes. Good. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, just to continue what I was saying, one thing it teaches us is that Jesus was seen to be a threat by the Roman authorities. That's important, right? It's important because it tells us something about the radical nature of what Jesus was preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus is preaching about the inbreaking reign of God yes. was threatening mm -hmm. to the authorities. They saw that as being potentially destabilizing to the existing Roman authorities. They thought 
if he's talking about a new kingdom coming, then that probably means the end of our kingdom, mm -hmm. right? So the crucifixion shows us that that must have been a threat, right? So that's one of the things that it shows us. Um, another thing that it shows us is we know that the religious authorities in some way were involved in bringing Jesus to the Roman authorities. At least it seems that he was also seen as a threat to at least some of the religious authorities of the day. Um, and that's important because it shows us how Jesus was seen as a, as a radical, threatening teacher. Right? So those things are important to, to recognize about, um, about who Jesus was. So those religious authorities who mm -hmm. were part of bringing Jesus to that point, mm -hmm. they had already studied that there will be a time a Messiah will come. Mm -hmm. Right. So why didn't they believe him? That's a great question. Why indeed? Um, of course, there were different interpretations of what the Messiah would look like. Or, so... So there wasn't just one shared opinion, yes. right, about about uh, who that would be. But but apparently Jesus um, upset the ideas of at least some of the religious authorities, right? At least some of them didn't expect uh, this kind of a person, right? To so take that he was too low level. Perhaps um, he was perhaps that, yeah. Um, I'm not sure, really. I mean, just, just, I'll just tell you the honest truth. You know, what we can tell is that it was upsetting. Um, it's also possible that some of the religious authorities didn't think that the Messiah was coming right yet. Oh, so right? they may not have had that messianic expectation at the moment. Okay. That's so, so the so they might have viewed it as uh, blasphemous. Right. Yeah. At that point. At yeah. That point. I think they said it somehow. Yeah, and and certainly they seem to have regarded it as blasphemy for him to identify himself so closely with God. Right. Yeah. Um, so even for people who might be expecting a Messiah, they, for him to be saying things and suggesting things that suggested his closeness with God might have felt a little too too much blasphemous. for them to, to at been. that point. Yeah. That could have been part yeah. Of so as people still in that position now, even after so many years after Jesus died? Oh, that's a great question. Are people still in that position now? Positions of authority who yeah. might be threatened? Yeah. Yeah. By, I think, by him? I think so, don't you? I mean, I think that, yeah. <laughs> I think that especially um, if we think about the way that Jesus preached, um, you know, the exaltation of the lowly, right? Uh, good news to the captives, all the things he says about... Um, uh, visiting, you know, prisoners and uh, the poor and the lowly and the widows and the orphans. I mean, all of his preference for the people who are at the margins of society. Mm -hmm. um, if those people are the people who are particularly beloved by God, then that can feel threatening to, to people in power. Yeah. Right. So I, I, I can say then that people who were in authority at that time mm -hmm. were people who who had much power, mm -hmm. who had money who did mm -hmm. what they wanted, mm -hmm. and then Jesus come and give hope to these people who don't have hope at all. Right, right. And so they are like, no, you cannot be like us. We cannot be equals. Right. So at that point, they try to threaten the person because mm -hmm. you realize that the people on the other side who had no hope mm -hmm. decided to follow Jesus. Right, and there could be an uprising. Yes. I mean, I think, I think that concretely, they might have worried that there would be Right, a political uprising yeah. that would that people will become equal because yeah. you know sometimes most yeah. of what happens to us is kind of mm. your mind is in slavery. Yeah. yeah. And this time somebody is here to open it up and say, No, that is not how it is. Yeah. You can get out of this situation, mm -hmm. but your slave master mm -hmm. it's ready to make sure you still remain down there. Yeah. Do you think that's kind of what could have happened at a time? I think that's well said. I think that's really well said. Yeah, I think that could be very threatening to people in power. Okay. Yeah. So, with that being said, we'll continue. The cross has a lot to say about it. So, yeah. we'll just focus on one particular and we keep going. Yeah. So, on the cross, we realized that Jesus said, mm. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Yeah. He was God. Right. So, 
why that? Right, that's yeah. a great question, right? Well, so one thing we need to recognize, of course, is um, Jesus there is, uh, he's quoting the beginning of Psalm 22. Mm -hmm. So when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, here, I'll tell you what, I've got my Bible here. So I'm just going to pull out Psalm 22 um, just to get the words here. And yeah, so the, the version I'm looking at here says literally, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it goes on, why are you so far from helping me from my words of my groaning? The words of my groaning. So, so Jesus is not making something up, yes. right? And to begin with, he's, he's using the words of a psalm that he would have known, he would have grown up praying. And um, so that's one thing to say. And some people, some scholars want to point out that the psalm ends with hope. So uh, there's a lot, I mean, the whole psalm is a prayer for deliverance and from suffering, um, but it does end with this. I'll just, I'll just read to you the end of Psalm 22. It says, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. So one thing that's interesting is Jesus didn't say all of that, right? He prays the first part of the psalm, but in recognizing where that comes from, we also need to recognize that the psalm goes somewhere, okay. right, and ends in hope. However, it's still, I want to get back to your question because it's a really important one. Yeah. Clearly, clearly on the cross, Jesus cries out what some call the cry of dereliction. It's a, it's a cry of absolute suffering, yes. right, absolute sense of God's absence. So what do we do with that? Um, here's what I want to say about that. I think that Jesus at that moment genuinely experienced the sense of separation from God. I think that even though we identify Jesus as also being fully divine, I think at that moment he is experiencing the depth of human pain and suffering and he's giving voice to that. Okay. So I think two things. I think one is what we see in Jesus at that moment is solidarity with our suffering, mm -hmm. right? So all of us in our suffering yes. can look at Jesus and say, right, Jesus has also been there. Yes. There is nothing that we experience that Jesus has not already experienced in terms of suffering and separation. And, and that's critical, mm -hmm. I think, yes. right? But there's another side, and this I think is also important, <laughs> right? If we also think of Jesus as fully God, fully divine, then what what does that mean for God's own experience on the cross? Here, this is a little controversial, um, but I'm going to agree with a theologian named Jürgen Moltmann, who's still alive, he's a German theologian, writing today. He wrote a really important book called The Crucified God. And in that book, he says, on the cross, um, God the Father suffers the death of the Son, and God the Son suffers the absence of the Father. Okay. So it's powerful, yes, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. It is deep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is really deep. Yeah. Okay. That is interesting to know. We, we want to understand because yeah. it's like we hope in Christ. Mm -hmm. When we come to Christ, we know, and we know that yes. Mm -hmm. And so nothing can befall him. He has power. Mm -hmm. He has absolute power over the universe. Mm -hmm. Everything that is in it. Mm -hmm. So when I see my God crying, yeah. then where is my hope? Right. Right. Do, do you do you understand? Where I do. I hope? do. And yet, and yet, here's what I would say. I think that hope is also connected with um, the suffering. Right. I think that the hope also depends on 
Jesus knowing the depth of our suffering, not being conquered by it, but but being present in it. Again, so that when we are in the midst of suffering, we know that Jesus has also experienced that, right? Yes. So where is the hope? I think the hope comes that that's not the end of the story. Yes. Right? Yes. The cross is not the end of the story. No, no, no not at all. It right. is the beginning, really. Right. right. That, because that's what gave us hope. Mm -hmm. So that is the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the vital thing for me is to recognize the way that the cross opens the door, if you will, to resurrection, right? Yes. That, that it, is, uh, it is a real death, right? It's a real human death. Mm -hmm. And after three days, there is this proclamation that Jesus has been raised from the dead mm -hmm. of mysterious, uh, kind of strange claim at the time, right? Yes. This had never been said before. This no. is a strange thing to say. But, uh, but to say that Jesus had been raised from the dead clearly declares that death was not the end. Right, well, and so in a way, you could say that the end of Psalm 22 points to that, to the like the resurrection, yeah. because the suffering will end in something. Right, right. yeah. So and it ended in something. Right. Okay. I think so. So yeah, viewers, I hope you are learning just as I am. Mm. We are going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with you. Stay with us, please, don't go. Stay with that. Grace and peace to you, my friends. I am Richard D. Johnson, a teenage student at the Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, USA. This is EMIF TV, a very strong television program for Christians all around the world. There are two guiding principles, two emerging truths that guide this particular television program. They are to plant the seed of hope in the lives of the hopeless and to encourage Christians to live independently in Christ. I am thrilled by the second guiding principle to encourage Christians to live independently in Christ. In this 21st century, it is very significant that every Christian will have an understanding of God on how to be able to live not just a successful life, but a faithful life in God. So therefore, my friends who are out there, if you want to be able to live a successful but faithful life in Christ, I invite you to Image TV. Come, because there will be hope for the hopeless. Amen. Welcome back again, viewers, as we continue our discussion on the cross. We've heard a lot about the cross, and we still have a lot to hear from Dr. Martin. So let's go back to her as she tells us some of the significance of the class. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah. so we've talked some about um, the historical significance of the cross, because I do think it's important to think about what the cross meant in the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. But then I think going forward, it's important to ask, well, what, what has the cross meant to Christians through okay. the ages and then to today, right? So. I'll just describe uh, maybe three different ways that Christians have interpreted the cross. There are lots of ways, yeah. lots of ways, but I'll give three examples okay. of ways that Christians have interpreted the cross um, over the years, uh, and then maybe we can reflect a little bit on, on what I think is most important today. Um, but to begin with, in the early church, uh, many people saw the cross primarily as um, that, if you will, prelude to resurrection. Okay. Right? That is to say, the most important thing was to focus on uh, the triumph of Christ over death mm -hmm. at resurrection. Yeah. So if we think about in the early centuries, people were primarily concerned about the problem of death and suffering. They wanted to be delivered from death and suffering. So what did Jesus offer? Deliverance. Yes. from suffering and death, which they could see in the resurrection, yes. primarily. Yes. So if you think about that, then what does the cross mean in that kind of a context? The cross is primarily the uh, affirmation that Jesus really died, yes. right? That's primarily what the cross is. That 
In other words, the cross itself is not the point, no. if you will, right? The cross is the, um, the affirmation that for a time, for a time, it looked as though death had won. Yes. If you will, yes. right? Yes. Uh, and so some early theologians talk about um, this as a kind of a trick that Jesus plays on the devil, if you will. Now, I think there are problems with that, but, but you can see, it's in, in a way, it, it gives the appearance that death, that death has won. Yeah. But the real thing that we celebrate is that the Christ, right, the resurrection, that Christ has had victory over death. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one way of thinking about the cross. Um, it's to emphasize that Christ is the victor over death. death. And the cross is just about death. Another way, um, in the medieval period uh, in Europe, there was a, a teacher named Anselm who, who talked about the cross as paying the debt that humanity owed to God. Now, you may have heard this language, and I think a lot of people use this language today, yes. that, um, that the problem was that humanity in a state of sin had not given full honor to God in the way that we owe. Yeah, right? we haven't. Though. Which we haven't, right? I think, right, we can agree that's yeah. true. That's mm -hmm. true. So we have not paid God the honor that is God's due. Therefore, we're in a situation of debt. And Anselm said uh, that what happens on the cross is that uh, Jesus comes as somebody who's fully human and therefore pay, needs to pay the debt mm -hmm. as somebody who's human, but is also at the same time God, and as God has the power and the capacity mm -hmm. to pay this debt that, that humans can't, we can't pay. We just can't. Right? And so that is, um, what happens on the cross then is the payment of a debt because somehow the death of Jesus um, fulfills the what is owed to God, right? Mm -hmm. Notice though that that's a that's a different way of thinking about the cross, cross than yes. the earlier way, yes. right? Yes. So it's a different thing, um, but that that way of interpretation is also still, uh, I think, pretty uh, powerful and significant today. Here's a third way, and then you can tell me what you think. Uh, a third way uh, that some Christians have thought about the cross is that the cross itself um, is not a payment for a debt, but what it does is it shows God's amazing love for us. In other words, God loved us so much that God came to take on humanity and humanity's flesh to the point of even uh, giving up his life for us for us, right? That's another way of thinking about the cross, right? But when you look at all the three you have said, they, can, they are kind of intertwined. Say how? Like the pain of the death and okay. the love. Mm -hmm. If you do not love somebody, mm. I don't think you would willingly want to pay the attack. Oh, well, that's a good point. And actually, that's, that was an important thing that Anselm said, is that the payment of the debt comes out of God's love. Yes. Right. No, that, that's a good point. So it's kind there of... Is, that can be connected. Connected in a, in a certain way. Some way, somewhat. Yeah. But, but there are also differences. If you think about um, uh, the difference between saying that the cross is the payment of a debt versus the cross is primarily displaying God's love. Those are not necessarily the same, right? Um, in other words, you could say that the cross shows us God's love in entering into our human experience and suffering, right? Mm -hmm. That that shows us God's love without saying necessarily that it was, that the death itself was paying for for something, okay. right? Yeah, I see. I see where the yeah. difference is, is but yeah. it kind of still. I see, yeah, but I think there is a connection that can yeah. be made there. I agree. I agree. Uh -huh. Okay, so I want to ask this question. In one of the gospels, it says that carry your cross and follow me. Yes, Mark. So I think. yes, in yes. Mark, I think. Yeah. 
What does that mean to us? As oh, that's a great today? question. That's a great question. Does it mean literally that we should take up our cross? Yeah, and go I don't ahead. think no. I no. I think pass. not literally. <laughs> I think not literally. Um, I think what it means is that we do need to accept. One thing it means is it we need to accept the consequences of of uh, following the way of Christ. And we need to recognize that if we live, if we try to live faithfully, if we try to love the people that God sends to us to love, mm-hmm. if we try to um, you know, feed the hungry and uh, visit those who are sick and in prison, if we try to minister to those who are um, oppressed in various ways, there are going to be consequences for living that way. Yeah. And um, that for each of us, that's going to look different. But, but, but the sometimes those consequences might involve uh, real sacrifice. Right? It Even might, to the point of death. Sometimes to the point of death. I think about um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer as an example. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian, uh, pastor, Lutheran pastor, um, who lived in the 1920s and 30s during the time of the rise of um, Hitler and under Nazi Germany. And Bonhoeffer sought so much to be faithful to what he understood Jesus to be calling him to do, that he even um, participated in a plot to assassinate Hitler. Okay. Now, it was not successful. Okay. But it was discovered, okay. and as a result, he was imprisoned, and he was ultimately killed. So, I mean, that's an extreme example, yeah. right? But I think in Bonhoeffer, we see an example of a, of a uh, 20th century martyr who, who did, in fact, die because of what he regarded as the most faithful choice. Yeah. So, can, can, is, is that to say that Christianity when you choose to be a Christian or you choose to follow the steps of Christ, mm-hmm. you are not going to have this all uh, kind of, in quotes, normal life. Right. Your life is going to be a little different from the ordinary life that everybody lives because mm-hmm. you have Christ and mm-hmm. carrying your cross and following him may involve things that is not ordinary. Mm-hmm. Can we then say that to be a Christian or to follow Christ the way he wants us to follow him Mm -hmm. can make you live a little odd odd yes (laughs) yeah and I and I say that um, yeah I say that with a a heavy heart because I am deeply aware of how uh, I do not right live up to that Right? No, I'm just being honest. And but but I think it's true. If I think about what uh, Jesus calls us to do, you know, I think about people like Martin Luther King, and I think about people like Nelson Mandela. Um, I think about you know people who have really taken seriously the call to follow Jesus in modern days, and uh, the way that that leads to real sacrifice. Um, but I can think of other people, right? Like, um, oh, there's a woman named Sister Helen Prejean, who is a nun living in the United States, whose mission in life is to minister to people on death row, so inmates on death row. So oh, she, okay. what she does uh, primarily in her ministry is to walk alongside um, primarily men who are who have done terrible things in their lives, who are in prison, uh, convicted, and sentenced to death. But these are precisely the people that Jesus has called her to love. And um, so in her case, it's not that she has called herself to give up her life in a literal sense, right? She she has a lot of joy uh, in life. She's, I've heard her speak, and she's a remarkable person. So she does serious hard work with people who are uh, at, who, who are, right? facing death themselves, okay, yeah. and she tries to be the face of Christ to them, to, them. to show them love. People who rarely 
receive any love in their lives, right? She's called to love them. So I think that's another example of somebody who, who seeks to be faithful and to carry the cross in a way um, that has real consequences in her life, but it doesn't mean that she's literally right. Living an odd life. It's an she's, odd life. But she's still happy. About but she's still joyful. Okay. Right? Yeah. So I think we can look to other examples like that, right, of people who find uh, real uh, joy and communicate real joy in their lives uh, as they follow Christ's call. Yeah. So in uh, today world, in yeah. this century that we are yeah. in, is the cross still a threat? Is it still a threat? A threat? Yeah. I think it is. I think it is a th uh, well. It's a threat in the sense that it reminds us of um, the cost of discipleship, yes. if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think too often, my sense is too often the cross becomes just a trinket. Right, something that we wear, something that we see. It's a, something we see on a billboard, mm -hmm. or it's a piece of jewelry, yeah, right? And um, and we don't always step back and ponder what it means in terms of the call on our lives, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, can you tell us the importance of the cross? in Christianity today, the importance yeah. of it. Yeah. So I would go back to um, one of the interpretations of the cross that I talked about earlier that I find really compelling is the reminder that the cross is not the end of the story. Um, and that the cross would have no significance at all if it weren't for the resurrection. Yes. And so what is the significance of the cross for today? For me, it is uh, twofold. It is that God has stepped into the depth of our suffering. I think that that's profoundly significant. And that that suffering and death is not the end of the story. Sure. Right? And yeah. that life and joy are what God desires and what God offers on the far side of that death. Okay, so viewers, we've had it all. The cross is not the end of the story. There was a resurrection, and that means there's hope. Hmm. So if you're a Christian and you carry your cross and follow Christ, that is not the end of your story. There's definitely hope in your resurrection too, because we are looking to Jesus, and what he did is what we are doing. So if there was resurrection for him, if we faithfully carry our cross and follow Christ, we will be resurrected too. Mm -hmm. So I want to assure you that the cross is significant. It's important in our lives, just as the doctor has said. We have to just not look at it, wear them, look at them and not do anything. But we have to, when we look, let us reflect on what Christ did and what he's expecting us to do now in our today life to make the cross important so when you look at it next time think about it okay mm -hmm. don't just look at it think about it i'm going to give doctor the opportunity to give her last word to us mm -hmm. on emf tv mm -hmm. and then we will take her from there so doctor thank you thank you thanks again for coming yes. we really appreciate you yes so we want you to I'm give grateful. a last word to our viewers today. okay I think here's where I'm going to end. I'm going to go back to Psalm 22, because I think that uh, this is where I'm going to end, if I may. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to read this again. Remember that this is the psalm that begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Remember that those were the words that Jesus uh, proclaimed from the cross. And remember this, that this is the end of that psalm where I think we might hope Jesus himself placed his hope. Um, and ultimately, I think this is what we see. Again, I'm reading uh, this end of Psalm 22. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, 
and he rules over the nations. Let me pause there because I do want to say when we hear that language of dominion and rule, I think it's important that we not hear that as ruling like a a tyrant or an (laughs) oppressor, right? This is a different kind of dominion. This is a ruling that is a a peaceful and just and a righteous rule. And it goes on, to him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him, that is God, shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. I think that's powerful if we think about that as Jesus' own words, right? I, Jesus, I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Thank you very much. So viewers, once again, this is EMF TV. We thank a lot for such a wonderful discussion about the cross. I know you've learned something today. I want to use the opportunity to thank my producers, Mr. Evans Vamenta, who happens to be my own husband, and Mr. Richard Johnson, who is always with us and helping us through our questioning and all our discussions. We really appreciate him. Don't leave us, please. Come back again because we are bringing hope to the hopeless. We want you to understand Christ for who he is. And your life will never be the same. Because when you know Christ and you know him well, life is more meaningful. But if you don't understand it well, then it's more difficult to live. So come back to us all the time. And I assure you, your life will never be the same. So see you next time, same time next week. This is IMAF TV. And we really appreciate you. Thank you, Doctor, for coming once Thank again. You. And we really appreciate you for coming. Thank you. We hope to have you another time. And we talk about more things about the cross. Thank you, viewers, and see you again next time. Bye.